morning, everyone. Thank you for joining me this morning here at the Southampton History Museum. I had a little trouble with my computer at Town Hall in my basement office, so I am here. Um, and uh, to get started by map and by letter, 1797, mapping history. Um, this map was um, done by or sent by David Hedges. Um, and there was an enormous amount of history to be gleaned from this map and the Hedges letter that accompanied it that I am now going to read. For the purposes of this talk, I will read uh, what the town supervisor David Hedges um, letter highlights the part. And um, I have visually uh, arranged it for you on, on, on the maps as we go. So slide one, this is the, um, the map that was uh, done in 1797. We know that there was a letter sent from Simeon DeWitt, who was a surveyor general um, for the state of New York in 1797 as an act of legislature that was passed um, on March 28, 1797. The law applied specifically to towns and counties of Albany, Columbia, Dutchess, Kings, Orange, Queens, Richmond, Saratoga, Suffolk, Ulster, and Westchester. It required filling of the maps by February 1st, 1798, and a penalty would be specified for a supervisor who failed to comply with the statutory requirement. The law also authorized the surveyor general to require filling out a boundary map for any other town on request. Subsequent legislation of the laws of 1800, chapter 56 reiterated that requirement. Townships in the Southern, southern area of the state had been surveyed before piecemeal. So supervisors in this part of the state were requested in 1797 to provide maps and narratives of their townships, describing boundaries, notable physical features, inventories of mills, timber and crops, farming and climatic details, as well as information on the number of houses, church denominations, taverns, and the number of doctors, lawyers, ministers, and school teachers. The maps were produced by local surveyors and dis a display a, and displayed a wide variety of scales, styles, and symbolis, symbolization techniques, illustrating the lack of consensus about what should be included or excluded from these documents. The descriptions provide a valuable historic record of contemporary farming practice insights to, into community life. So here we have, um, this is Simeon DeWitt, um, painted by Ezra Ames in, um, around 1804. He was a New York Surveyor General. He was born in 1756, was a geographer and surveyor general of the Continental Army during the American Revolution and the surveyor general of the state of New York for 50 years from 1784 until his death in 1834. The purpose of asking for local maps was to produce a larger New York state map that was ultimately completed by DeWitt in 1802, which you'll see at the end of this presentation. Um, a little bit about De uh, De Deacon David Hedges. He was our um, supervisor at the time. He lived from 1744 to 18, eight, uh, 1817. He lived, um, he was a prominent preacher and statesman. He served for 20 years as a supervisor of the Southampton town, was a member of New York's fourth provincial Congress, which adopted the first state constitution and was a delegate to, delegate to the con con convention that ratified the constitution of the United States. The house he built that you see here is located on Hedges Lane and a street that was named for the family of which at one point consisted of only, he only houses owned by the Hedges relatives. Um, this house actually um, has just recently been saved and is under the process of restoration. So we're very happy um, that this house survives. It's an important um, house uh, due to its significance built in 1775, as well as the person that um, lived in it. This is um, the Brookhaven map that was done in 1797. I put this in just to show um, we believe that that our, our map was um, surveyed by um, Isaac Hulse, who also did Brookhaven. Um, our the Southampton town maps lacking some information on the left-hand side. It's been deteriorated over time. Um, so I want, wanted to include this. Handwriting looks similar. So we assume that it's probably um, the same surveyor that did this map for, for the town of Southampton. That's part of the Brookhaven that was done for uh, Supervisor William Phillips. And as you can see on the left-hand side of the map, a lot of the um, text uh, that was written um, 
has been been lost. Um, just to let you know that this um, this map is housed at the state archives, along with the letter that Supervisor David Hedges sent to accompany it. Um, I have a copy of the letter. It's a very poor copy of the actual, the original letter. Um, so I have a transcribed copy that I'm going to read from. And this letter is the one that survives. The what, letter that doesn't survive is the letter from Simeon DeWitt to all the town supervisors um, asking um, for descriptive details of their town, um, basically the instructions. Um, I've been searching and looking through um, and asking other town historians in Suffolk County if anybody has the map. Unfortunately, Hedges did not um, save the letter from DeWitt, so I don't have that, um, but we have an idea of what he was looking for. So this was the beginning of the letter um, from David Hedges, the supervisor to Simeon DeWitt. It was dated Sag Harbor, December 30th, 1797. Sir, I have the honor herewith to enclose you a map of the town of Southampton, which I have caused to have taken agreeable to the instructions in your letter of the 20th of last May and conformable to an act of legislature for that purpose made and provided. The enclosed remarks are not methodized and disposed in that order as could have been wished, but may be, may, may be by you be arranged in such order as you may think. I am, sir, respectfully, your obedient servant, David Hedges, supervisor. So the descriptive letter goes, in answer to the sir, in answer to the surveyor general's request, we offer the following notes. Original name of the town in Indian is Shinnecock. Significant, signification unknown date and history of the settlement not exactly known by reason of the ancient records being burnt by accident. This actually isn't true. In 1797, they thought that all of the town records were lost up until that time. But um, William S. Pelletro in the mid 1800s um, was able to find and put together the records. So we do have records back as early as 1639, um, all the way up until present day. So he goes on to say about on a quarter of the lands cultivated, the rest is forest or barren plains. The general quality of the soil along through the middle, the whole length of the township is a light sand, barren soil, but also each side tolerably good. He goes on to talk about the timber and the trees. The prevailing species of timber are oak, hickory, and pine, as you can see here from these illustrations. There are no quarries of limestone or freestone. There are no mines, nor minerals, nor medicinal waters, which is interesting to note that during the Victorian era, when the railroad came out here in 1870, um, doctors were prescribing people to come to the east end of Long Island uh, for the medicinal salt air breezes and, and to bathe in the restorative ocean waters. So we have some medicinal waters out here. Um, also interesting to note is that since there, is, there are no stone quarries, um, you'll not see rock walls that are you know, uh, indigenous to the area. Um, they dug ditches to do property lines or they lop trees, which is a cutting of a tree in order to make it um, a certain shape. And they used um, innumerable amounts of uh, split rail fencing throughout the town. So, so Southampton town at this time was still an agrarian society. And um, David Hedges gets into um, the different types of um, produce um, that, that was uh, grown out here. Um, I tried to make this a little bit more interesting. I tried to use some more visual things um, and I hope that it's um, not distracting and, and you get the idea of where I'm coming from. So David Hedges writes, the usual yield of wheat and rye are from six to 10 bushels per acre, but from good land well manured from 20 to 30 bushels per acre in good seasons, when it escapes the mildew, which is very prevalent in our country, still is milled and mold and mildew. Um, the usual yield of Indian corn is between 20 and 30 bushels per acre, but on the best land from 40 to 50 bushels, tolerable good for potatoes. Uh, seed time in the latter end of September for wheat and rye, for flax and oats the month of April, and for Indian corn all the month of May. Interesting to note, according to the Long Island Farm Bureau, farming is still alive and well on Long Island. Suffolk and Nassau counties together have 592 farms 
on approximately 31,000 acres of farmland, mostly in Suffolk, with 61 uh, vineyards. Suffolk County has the largest number in the state. The region ranked first in the state for aquaculture. Suffolk County ranks fourth in the state for overall agricultural sales, and it's also first for sales of bedding and gardening plants, as well as for the amount of tomatoes harvested. They weren't harvesting tomatoes back in 1797. So we'll move on to the next slide to show other things that are here in Southampton at the time. Hedges reports the dandelion appears from the middle to the latter end of April with the violet and peach tree blossoms from the latter end of April to, and the word unfortunately is, un, um, I can't discern what he wrote, but of May, the apple trees and the fore part of May. He also mentions the swallow appear at the latter end of April and disappear in the month of September. The earliest frost in common is in October and with the last in the first of May. The next slide shows the vermin. Insects and vermin injur injurious to grain and other vegetables and trees are the caterpillar, the canker worm, white ground worm, the mole, the mouse, the squirrel, the crow and the common blackbird. And they're all represented here on the map. The next slide shows the commodities that were shipped out of um, probably Sag Harbor's point, port at the time. Um, so we have flax um, and all the different products. So we have flax um, to use for weaving products, flax as a medicinal oil, um, flax uh, for um, the middle items there that are hard to see our, um, our textiles um, and flax uh, thread and yarn, and then the other bottle of medicinal flax, flax oil. The middle um, is beef, um, was a big commodity out here that raising cattle. And this, um, the third item was cordwood. Um, when you settled in, in the town of Southampton, you were given a home lot, uh, meadow lot, um, a farm lot and a wood lot. And the wood lot um, afforded you trees that you could cut down for your own fuel, for your home, for heating, for, um, for building, um, as well as you could ship it um, out of Sag Harbor into the city and to other parts. Um, there was a big coastal trading uh, market outside of uh, Sag Harbor up and down the coast, um, Eastern seaboard. Um, so this is where a lot of our card cordwood went. And those were the three largest commodities at the time in 1797. But the next slide shows all the mills that were in the town. Um, I used a windmill to feature all of them. They're not just windmills, they're grist mills or water mills, um, they're fulling mills, um, but you get the idea um, what we, how we used the power of the wind and the water to generate um, our commodities here in Southampton Town. So there were 18 grist mills of which four go by water, six sawmills and four fulling mills. So we have, um, we have a windmill in, Sag, um, in Hogs Neck, which is North Haven. We have a windmill in Sag Harbor. We have a windmill in Sag, two windmills in Sagaponic, a spider leg mill, um, as well as a regular windmill. We have one in uh, Meacox and Bridgehampton. We have one in North Sea. Uh, which was a water mill. We have the water mill in water mill, um, and we have a couple of others um, on the western portion of the town as well. Um, there was a water mill in Flanders as well as at Riverhead on the Conic. Um, there was a mill in Eastport, um, a mill in um, a Beaver Dam, which is West Hampton Beach area, and then one in Quag. And uh, uh, I'm sorry, also one in uh, Good Grounds, which is now Hampton Bays. Our next slide shows um, what Deacon Hedges talks about are the schools. So there are nine schoolhouses, four Presbyterian churches, and two libraries. And I've used some um, little buildings here to show where they were. So the first Presbyterian church was um, on your left-hand screen is at Beaver Dam. That's the West Hampton Church. The uh, next church is here to the right is here in Southampton Village. Um, this church would have been the church in 1707 um, and that was used until 1843 when the church across the street from here uh, was built. Also the Bridgehampton church is the next one on the bottom that was built in 1742 and was used until 18, 
1944 when the second church that is on Main Street that's still standing today was built. Um, there is a marker on the lawn of, um, of the road that shows where that church stood. And then the top church would have been the church in Sag Harbor. It's called the Old Barn Church. Um, and of the three, of the, um, of the four churches, I do have two images of the, those buildings that were standing. And I'll show you those in a second. Um, there were two libraries. I know there was one in Bridgehampton. Uh, Levi Hildreth kept it in his attic. I don't know um, where the other one was. I'm presuming it was in Sag Harbor, um, but I wasn't able to find any details about that um, until um, uh, in time for this um, presentation. So the two churches that I do know what they look like, um, the, the church on the left, that's the 1707 Southampton Church, Presbyterian Church that was right here in the village on Main Street. And the church on the right is the church that stood in Bridgehampton on Sagaponic Road from 1742 to 1844. And we're lucky to have images of those two churches still in our presence. The next um, item that um, Hedges mentions in his letter um, are the fish, the species of fish. Um, he mentions species of fish are bass, perch, herring, sheep's head, menhaden, and the whale, with a variety of other small fish, which are taken in large quantities, particularly the bass and the menhaden, which is bunker, um, the latter of which is used, which is esteemed highly for, ma for manure. Our next slide um, is the poorhouse that stood in Sagaponic. It was actually not standing when Hedges wrote this letter. This was built in the earlier part, about 1818 um, in Sagaponic. It's on Sag Main Street. It's on the east side of the street. Um, but he does mention the poor in his letter. So he writes, the number of poor is 13, we are um, which are taken into families who will keep them the lowest and is supposed to cost the town 300 shillings 300 pounds per, per year. The poor have always been taken care of it, um, in the town of Southampton as early as 1642. This is my, my note. And originally um, you were taken in by a family and that family would receive funds to house you. Um, and the town paid that cost. Um, later at the turn of the 20th century, uh, this house was built uh, for, for the poor of the town, um, mostly widows, uh, people of, of of a certain age and um, anyone with a disability. I know there were there were there was one blind child in the town of Southampton at the time and he, he would have he would have been living at a home um, having been taken care of. Um, this particular poor house had a working farm on it. So those that lived here um, could do farming um, or were used to help farm the land um, as best they could. So our next um, slide is about the physicians, the ministers, and the schoolmasters. So the physicians, um, Hedges writes, their physicians are six, ministers of the gospel, four, schoolmasters, nine. So I did a little bit of research on this, and I was able to find some of those um, who were, at the time, the physicians. So there was Dr. Silas Halsey. He was a physician. Um, he basically dealt a lot with the poor of the town, uh, ministering to them and, and giving medical advice and administering medical um, things here. I wanted to show this, the picture on the left of the physicians. Um, he's actually administering a smallpox vaccination, which I found quite um, notable for today's with our vaccination issues. Um, the ministers of the gospel in the center there, there were four, two of which I know. So Reverend Aaron Woolworth was the minister at the Presbyterian Church in Bridgehampton. And then Reverend David Bogart was the minister here in Southampton um, at the 1707 church. Um, it's interesting to note that uh, Bogart's two grandsons were two of the founders, Augustus and um, and now I've lost their names. I'm sorry, um, started the Southampton summer colony here. And the next slide. Oh, I wanted to talk about schoolmasters. Sorry about that. So I was able to find all the schoolmasters that were teaching here 
um, in the town of Southampton. So William Herrick was teaching in Southampton. Benjamin Hobart was teaching in Sagaponic. Timothy Halsey was at the Scuttle Hole School in Bridgehampton. Um, Sag Harbor didn't, doesn't have a particular uh, schoolmaster associated with it, but um, three men who were the um, commissioners of the school in Sag Harbor were Samuel Lomdu, Henry Packing Deering, and Noah Mason. They're listed on um, the form uh, that the teachers filled out to show how many students they had for how long and how many days they were in school. Uh, Bridgehampton was taught by Mr. D. Gibbs. Uh, the North Sea School was taught by Lemuel Sanford. The Quag School was, was taught by Josiah Foster. The West Hampton Beach School or the Ketchaponic School was taught by Jared Gardner. And the Hogneck School, which is North Haven, was taught by Samuel Waters. These um, schools were most likely um, in homes of the teachers or homes uh, that had room that they could take in uh, students during the day. The next slide shows um, Supervisor Hedges doesn't say much other than the portion of oxen and horses used in draft is, is nearly equal. So we have a draft horse and the oxen um, in their, their yokes. Um, I don't know the number, but uh, probably pretty significant, especially if beef was a commodity. Um, and um, flax, you would need the horse and the oxen to do those things. Um, the next slide is whaling. And as he uh, Supervisor Hedges says, the peculiar custom of the inhabitants in the winter season is to attend at the seashore and look out for whale and generally take one or more annually. And when taken, will make from 20 to 90 barrels of oil. So this is onshore whaling. This was before um, whaling on ships uh, became uh, the economy that was, uh, you know, whaling ships going out of Sag Harbor. So these are whale. These are men uh, with a whale that's been cast up on shore, or um, they've hired people to go out um, around the coast. And what happened is, after all this coast, they kind of um, drove all the whales further, further away. Um, so that's why they had to get on ships to go out and um, uh, catch the whales. This is showing um, rendering of the whale oil um, and everybody is participating in this. And our next slide is of Sag Harbor. And I'm just gonna read what he had to say about Sag Harbor. He kind of does a little bit of more detail, specifically the port of Sag Harbor, which was um, at the time, um, just starting to becoming a whaling port of uh, note. And this is what he says. The following historical remarks respecting the settlement of the port of Sag Harbor, which is situate within the township may not be improper. The increase in population perhaps is at great considering its situation as, as any part of the state. Within the remembrance of many persons now living, there are but two houses at Sag Harbor. From these small beginnings, it increased to such a degree as to erect their present house of public worship in the year 1766. During the late war, being much exposed to the enemy, it, it experienced great desolation, together with the exilement of its inhabitants, which was in the year 1776. In the year 1783, at the return of peace, there were about 22 dwelling houses left standing and many of them not tenable. Um, uh, just a little cap on the Revolutionary War here in uh, the town of Southampton. Um, it went on for such a long time. Um, many families fled um, Sag Harbor um, and went to Connecticut across the Sound. Um, the British took over Sag Harbor. They took over just about every, all of the villages out here. They commandeered houses and farms um, and they just really desolated the area. Um, so in 1797, we're less than 20 years out of um, the Revolutionary War out here. So um, everybody's picking up the pieces still and putting everything back together. Um, but he does say in 1797, at present, there are 87 dwelling houses besides stores and upwards of a hundred families. There are upwards of a thousand tons of shipping from the port employed in the whale fishery, 800 tons and upwards of vessels employed in the cod fishery and nearly 800 tons of coastal vessels belonging to the port. 
They have a large and spacious schoolhouse in which they are taught daily upwards of 60 pupils through the year and was entitled to one quarter part of the school money raised and distributed in the township. And as I talked earlier about the poor of the town, um, he, he ended his letter. It might with propriety have been mentioned the proper place as a very singular incident that out of the 13 poor supported by the town, eight of them are upwards of 80 years of age, two nearly 80, two, um, it's missing, um, one, uh, the words, word is missing, and then there's one blind child, 10 years of age. They cost the, the town at average rate nine pounds per week. And it is most frequently noticed that the subject of the poor, which are supported by the town, have caused, um, he says it's their idleness and intemperance have been the cause of their misfortune. This is the case with most of our poor and we have to regret that there is a law our state, that there is, um, and a word is missing, a law our state that should enable certain select men to take the estate of such persons as are spending them in idleness and intemperance into the care and charge and secure them for their, for their children and their own use. So he's putting in his own little bid for um, what should be done um, for the poor um, in the town um, by new legislation from the state. And here's a picture of whaling of the port of Sag Harbor. Um, so I, as I mentioned in the earlier um, in the presentation that this was all put together, um, Simeon DeWitt was asking all the town supervisors to put together and draw up maps and give details because he was putting together a larger map of the state of New York. Um, so in 1802, this is the map that Simeon DeWitt created. Um, and as you can see, the larger detail of Southampton town into East Hampton. Um, it doesn't give too much detail, but it shows a little bit of what was going on, um, where houses were, where where the main uh, population existed in the town of Southampton. So um, Simeon DeWitt writes, it depicts townships, rivers, lakes, settlements, roads, Indian castles, occasional swamps, ironworks, and mills. The topography confined to the southern end of the state il illustrates the skill in the perspective portrayal of relief features. It is considered uh, it's considered, DeWitt considered perspective to be an essential part of a good education for both men and women and wrote a pamphlet detailing its technique and describing the drafting equipment that could be, could be um, made to aid in creating drawing perspectives. So thank you very much. Thanks, Connor. All right, thank you, Julie. Um, if anybody does have any questions about anything that was just discussed, please feel free to submit it in the Q&A function or in the chat, and I'll go ahead and read through what we have, <clears throat> ask Julie, and we'll see if we can come up with some answers. Um, so the first question that I have here, it uh, says, very informative talk, thank you. How many mills were there in Southampton? So there were 18 total. Um, that would be wind, um, you know, windmill and watermill. Um, the majority of them were um, on the southern part, uh, Meacock, Sag Sagaponic, Sag Harbor, um, Bridgehampton had quite a few mills, um, windmills. Um, there was obviously the watermill that's still standing in watermill today. Um, that was a watermill in, um, in the Meacox watermill area. There was a watermill um, in North Sea, just where North Sea Road and uh, no, uh, Noyak Road meet, there was a mill there. There were a few um, in Flan, there were a couple in Flanders. There was one um, right on the border of Riverhead and Peconic uh, River. Um, there was one in Eastport, a uh, water mill. And then most of the other mills uh, were wind. Okay. Um, in the layout of this map, were the uh... Were the Shinnecock mentioned at all in their territory? He didn't mention um, he didn't mention anything about the Native American population. Um, as but all of you can see here, um, which is for a much larger discussion. Let me get back to the to the main map. Um, I don't know if I just zoomed that for everybody. Yeah. Um, but this entire section from Canoe Place on the left to Hetty Creek Line, which is 
um, where the reservation is now. You can see Shinnecock Great Neck um, down there on the right-hand side. This whole dark brown area was um, considered um, Shinnecock land. Um, all of Southampton Town, um, the first owner, you know, the, the rightful owners are the Shinnecock uh, tribe. Um, but in this particular time, in 1703, um, this, this land between Canoe Place and Hetty Creek on the south and Bull's Head Bay up on the north and North, uh, north, north Sea uh, was technically um, considered Shinnecock tribal land. They were given it in 1703 through a lease of a thousand years. Um, so there's a lot of sensitivity and controversy around this, exactly what the, the, the thousand year lease um, meant. There are three or four um, leases written at the same time for different factions. Um, so this is where we stand today. Um, I'll note that on the, in the very middle there at the lower part of the, um, the, in, uh, the Native American area is Sugarloaf Hill, um, which we just recently, the town has recently um, purchased an easement and now the Peconic Land Trust owns the property and it will be hopefully reverted back um, with the Shinnecock Nation as steward. So that's kind of where we are. Um, but as you may or may not know, in 1859, the state made a ruling that all this land that was leased to the Shinnecock tribe um, could be put up for sale. Um, and it's unclear, um, depending on who, you know, what um, history you read, um, that they traded the Shinnecock neck, which, they, um, that which, which is the reservation today, um, to outright own that forever um, and gave up the, le the thousand year lease on the rest of the property. It's like 3,200 acres, I, I believe. A, uh, a, a good documentary to watch if you're interested in that further story and discussion is uh, the Conscience Point film that came yes, out. Yes, excellent. It goes into great detail about uh, how that land got divvied up, why it got divvied up, and sort of, you know, some of the prevailing ideas about everything involved in that and it goes into right. great detail more so yes, than it does. we will right now yeah um let's see so the next next question we had here um it says north view of sag harbor 1797 or later oh i'm sorry the um at the at the um the port drawing the northern view of sag harbor that was done i believe in 1840 1840s okay yeah, and as you, can see, you can see here, yeah, this is, um, the whaling industry is already um, booming at this point. Um, and you can see uh, the Methodist church, which is right there in the center, which used to be up on Hill Street um, before, before mm -hmm. being moved to, um, to Madison, Madison Street in the 1860s. Uh, during the Civil War, they moved that church. Um, and then on the church on the right was this, the church that existed at the time in 1797 was called the Old Barn Church. Um, this building that's standing on the right-hand side was built in about 1831. So unfortunately, I don't have any images of those. I um, hope to find some. And as I mentioned, I just, and as you saw, we, we did have the two images of the two other churches that he mentioned being in existence. Um. Julie, will you be publishing an article with all this information? Um, no, but um, I have one now. <laughs> I hadn't <laughs> thought of it. <laughs> yeah, it's um, it's very interesting. Um, when I reached out to, um, I've reached out to the state archives. I've reached out to um, just about everybody. Um, and recently, with some of the local historians, um, some some of the historians knew of the map, and they had copies of their own map because I, as I mentioned, they're all held um, in the state archives. Um, we're aware of them and other historians did not know that this such a map existed. Um, and I was really looking to see if somebody had saved Simeon DeWitt's letter of instruction. And I'm hoping to still find that. So um, maybe I will, I will find it and I will maybe put this all together. Um, um, and maybe post it on the on the town's website. Uh, Connor, I sent you, I emailed you the, the links for the maps. 
Yeah. Um, the links for the 1802 and the links for the 1797 town of Southampton map, if anybody wanted to see, I don't know if you could throw it in the. I was going to say that that was the next question that somebody had posted was they were asking if the maps were available online. So what I'm going to do is I'll post uh, these links in the chat. So that way, if anyone's interested, they can check them out. Um, let me go for everyone. And then somebody else asked in the chat, um, what is that smoke rising out of Sag Harbor in this uh, picture here? Um, that would have been some sort of manufacturing that was going on. There were there were many uh, factories um, in Sag Harbor. I don't know what that one in particular is. Yeah, I think a safe bet maybe to say uh, maybe whale oil processing. That's maybe something probably something related to whale to the whale fishery. Yeah, yes, yes, absolutely. Um, and I also wanted to mention that um, according to some of the things I read, that Simeon Dewitt um, had requested to know how many taverns were in the town. Um, and I mm -hmm. thought it was very interesting that Deacon David Hedges, not Supervisor David Hedges, left taverns off his list. And um, there were many <laughs> yes. throughout um, the town. You have somebody else asking, uh, is the location of the North Sea water mill known? Um, not exact location um it's just would be on the northern side of of um the roadway and the railroad um bed that goes through there um i believe oh. it would i'm sorry i would say on that map you have uh if you if you scroll back up where you have like the mills located mm. um those are mostly just approximates right like, yeah those are approximate locations yeah right? so the one in yeah. water mill somewhere nearby. yeah so the <laughs> I can't move, but it would be down the, in 1797, it would be at the low, the lower place. Gotcha. Right? I just didn't want to cover some of the words, although I don't know sure if it's legible. Yeah. Okay. Let's see. Does anybody else have any questions, comments, concerns, anything like that? Oh, we got another one. Uh, let's see. Libraries. One was in Bridgehampton, mm -hmm. in whose attic, the other in Sag Harbor. Right. Um, as I had mentioned, I'm not aware, I'm not 100% sure of where the second library stood. I am going on the inkling that it was in Sag Harbor. Um, I need to do a little bit more research on that. I wasn't able to find anything definitive um, just because of the, the whaling port that it was becoming, um, that it would have um, most likely have been in a store um, in Sag Harbor. Uh, libraries aren't technically the libraries that we know of today. Um, they were housed in stores. You could, you could um, come in and check out a book from um, one of your local mercantile stores. Or um, in, in the case in Bridgehampton, Levi Hildreth um, kept a library in his attic, um, which is kind of an interesting thing. And um, he was paid as a librarian and his pay was the the reading of any of the books that were in the library at his leisure. So um, he must have been a quite a reader. Um, so basically, the library system as we sort of know it today um, didn't really start until 1877 with the building of the Hampton Library in Bridgehampton. That library was the first library built as a library. It wasn't pri a prior school or a, a, a prior business, um, and. Uh, that's that was the first one in 1877 and it's interesting to note that um, in 1870 when the railroad came out they were trying to get people to use the railroad people didn't want to use it they were it took a lot to get across the east river to the railroad station it didn't go into manhattan yet um, to get people to come out so uh, they actually the long island railroad in 1876 um, shipped the lumber for the for the Hampton Library in Bridgehampton free of charge so that they could get um, uh, a destination, if you will, uh, for people to come out. Um, that there would be a library out here, a building mm -hmm. just for um, library purposes. Um, it was the only library until probably about 20 years later um, between Brooklyn and the Eastern end of Long Island. So I have somebody else asking if you could possibly zoom in on the Southampton Main Street um, but I don't know if 
you have a good zoomed in picture of it already? Let so me it might be a little the, blurry. Yeah, I think the first map is the, the, and I should also say that the map is actually in two pieces. So yeah. you can kind of see the split line there. Um, so I put them together and um, I don't know, can you see that at all? Yeah, it's a little blurry. I pulled it up on my other screen. Um, I, I, I won't uh, take off this share screen and stuff, but if you click the link that we sent in the chat and you can see it on the, um, where's that, on the New York State's website. Yeah, um, you can the see New York it really State clear. archives. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, when you zoom in on Southampton Main Street, it doesn't really give you too much information. Yeah, it just, um, it just says Southampton um, in the street. Um, you can see the church is, a, um, slightly larger building. It's got, looks like it's, they put a little bit of a steeple on it. So that's the 1707 church. You'll also notice that Meeting House Lane does not exist. The road that's um, just a little bit north that veers off to the right, that's the road to Bridgehampton. So that's, you know, uh, Hampton Road. Um, yeah. Citarella's Town Hall, all of it stands. So Meeting House Lane was put in much uh, later. Yeah, all the little squares, I think, are just demarking roughly where houses were, but That's none right. of them are named or anything like that. That's right, right. Unfortunately, um, well, you know, fortunately, in 1858, the Chase map was drawn. Yep. Uh, John Chase drew up a map of Suffolk County. Um, and in that, on that map, it's the first map, I believe, that has owner, um, you know, property owner names on it, which is... Um, which is wonderful for people doing research um, on their homes. Um, unfortunately, that's the that's the oldest map with names on it. These maps would just be, you know, marking locations of you know this one house could represent three in a, in a certain little area. Um, yeah. He, and the other thing that's unfortunate about this map is that I don't have, or it does not have. Um, any details it doesn't have a legend i don't know what things <laughs> mean um necessarily I, I assume those are those are you know homes and the churches are a little bit built up the mills are not um differentiated that much um but we could talk i mean you know he's you know he's uh, see if i can read some of this stuff um uh on the very left hand side right where it's torn um in it says, you know, this was they. This was a bound tree, so there is a tree, and we don't know if this tree still exists. That um, is marked for the the Southampton and Brookha Brookhaven Township as a marker. Huh. Yeah, an interesting map uh, that it's always fun when you find an old map that has no key and all these little markings, so you just have to really guess what's going on. Yeah. Um, it says here is a place called Quag Plains, um, providing no timber, um, and it's nearly three miles in diameter either way. Hmm. So, um, so the Ketchuponic Road to, to Riverhead, Riverhead is two words. Um, I, I do like, which um, I had not known, um, the, hunting, the Hunting Hills, which are the hills just north of Bridgehampton and Watermill, um, that there are actually particular names um, given to each. Um, so the, the Western Ridge is called Long Spring Hills. Then you have Pine Hills. Then you have Rescue Hill um, and Windmill Hill. Now Windmill Hill, um, I think I put the mill on the map um, that was built by John Wicks in the early 1700s. Um, it was up, it's basically at the corner of Scuttle mm -hmm. Hole Road and Brick Kiln Road, um, that would be Windmill Hill. Rescue Hill, I'm not sure what that means. Um, although I do know during the Revolutionary War, um, there was a farmer who was tired of um, giving his, his cattle um, and livestock to the British. So there is a, um, there is a depression, a, a deep kind of valley in the, in the hills where he hid all his cattle um, huh. while the, war was going on. Is there any indication where the original location of the windmill in Southampton Village might have been? Well, there's there was a horse horse mill um, which where the just just um, what is it just a little bit north of the Halsey House 
okay. Horse Mill Lane. So there was a windmill there. And I believe it may have been on the east side of uh, South Main Street. Is it indicated on this map or? No. No, gotcha. Yeah, the, the, unfortunately the buildings look very, they're just all similar. Um, I had originally thought that anything that had a little tick, you know, little tick at the top yeah. meant it was something different, but um, it doesn't do. seem to be the case. They all, yeah, some have them, some don't. Yeah. Some are smaller than others. Um, although, you know, the Bridgehampton meeting house, um, it sh it's drawn. It shows a little um, mm -hmm. building there on Sagaponic. Uh, the it first. Like all the churches were obviously marked, but everything else is just. Everything like, else is, yeah, kind of up square. for grabs. And, and you can see in the Sag Harbor, I don't know if people, if you can see these things, but there's wonderful little whaling ships and, and coastal trading ships drawn in. Um, yeah, I'll say on the then, websites, if you every if everyone goes to look, it's extremely clear, so you can see it a lot easier. Yeah, it's a tip file. It's it's not that it's nice. It's a large file, so you can really see it. Yeah. All right, I think I think that's all the questions we ha <clears throat> we had. Um, I want to thank you again, Julie, for. Uh, Giving this talk, um, maybe one, maybe once you finish uh, a little bit of the other research, uh, you'll get to post that article and share it around with everybody, so they can see Absolutely. all the final details. Absolutely, I, I'm. I hope that it was um, enjoyable to look at. Um, I, I, I'd like history to be as engaging and um, as fun um, as possible um, because it's it's important um, for everybody to learn to learn something new every day and uh, Southampton town is chock full. So thank you very much for, for, for attending. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you everybody nice, for joining us. Have a nice uh, Labor Day weekend. Yeah. Hopefully everybody has a good weekend uh, for anybody watching on YouTube later. I'm going to have down in the description, the links to these maps as well. So you guys can all check them out and hopefully you can sign up for any of our future lectures and programs over at southamptonhistory.org slash calendar. And uh, without any further ado, I guess we will see you all next time. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.